Good evening and welcome to the March 13th, 2018 meeting of the Gilderland Board of Education. Would you all please silence your cell phones and rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our first item on the agenda this evening is a discussion with Senator George Amador. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you so much for the invitation. And to uh, Superintendent Wiles and the members of the school board, I very much appreciate the invitation. And to all the administrators and, and faculty here in, in Gilderland, I really appreciate all of the hard work and dedication. You know, today was... Um, uh, a great day in, in, the, uh, in the concourse because Farnsworth was there and they were singing their little hearts out and playing their string instruments and the whole concourse was filled with the great music so I appreciate the uh, it's Gilderland Day in Albany. Well I know that uh, the budget is on everyone's mind and I know just even last week you presented uh, the your school budget and as you know, the governor's proposed his budget earlier this year, and the Senate and the Assembly are set to act on their one-house budgets tomorrow, which is the beginning of the negotiations on what will be hopefully an on-time budget and a good budget. And there are several areas of concern that I know uh, for Gilderland School District that's in the, sen that's in the uh, governor's proposal. Uh, those The Senate... Myself, share your concerns uh, with the numbers that have already been proposed. One of those areas of concern is a statewide cap on building aid. In the governor's budget proposed a statewide cap that would reduce aid if the statewide increase in budget in building aid exceeds two years in two percentages, two percent in a year. This would unfairly reduce aid on new construction. It would adversely affect debt service on prior projects. And I have several districts in the Senate district uh, that are planning capital projects. This proposal will have had made a virtually, make it virtually impossible for any district to identify the local share to taxpayers and complicate voter approval. So, Tomorrow, as our budget in the Senate comes out, our one-house budget, the Senate rejects this cap in, of this proposal that the governor has in his executive proposal. Our schools need improvements. You need the certainty to be able to create a capital plan and, and present it to the voters for approval. A statewide cap on building aid is problematic and unfair for districts. Another area of concern is the shift in special aid, special ed cost to school districts. Under the current reimbursement structure, districts get 80% of the cost of special, aid provide, special ed provided to students during summer months. The governor's proposed that a shift to wealth adjusted reimbursements, as some districts might see a reduction in their cost majority would end up paying more. The estimated loss to Gilderland would be about 25% reduction. That amounts to around $183,000. The Senate One House budget proposal tomorrow will reject this proposal and restore in its entirety $70 million statewide. Another issue of concern is a cap on expense-based aid. The governor proposed a cap on increases to BOCES and transportation aid. The Senate, myself, we reject this cap. All this will establish, all this will establish is forcing districts to divert resources to cover higher costs, many of which, for example, fuel costs, how do you predict? And I think that the district, this proposal that the governor has would only discourage shared services. Overall aid 
hear this a lot. Spoke to quite a few of the districts that are represent in the Senate district. And as you all know, it's a tough budget year. The governor has proposed a budget that would, as he says, that would increase aid, education funding, by 3%, which equates to around $769 million above last year. Now, last year's record, last year's aid was record levels. The Senate will act on his one-house budget tomorrow, and while the final details are now being worked out, which we're going to continue to work out even tonight, we will recommend an increase in education funding of approximately $1 billion, which will, which will include an increase in foundation aid, which I know is very important and a concern to most local school boards. Fully funding our schools remained a top priority to the Senate, and we will be as we, will as we always have been, a huge advocate and negotiate strong and more school funding. Now there's another issue that I'm sure is on everyone's mind, and I want to bring it to your attention, and that's school safety. I have been having numerous conversations with many school superintendents and members of the school board, as well as teachers. The Senate passed last week a comprehensive package of bills. It was 15 bills total. And these bills increased school security. It includes mental health initiatives, funding for more school resource officers, and calling for the release of funds from the Smart School Bond Act. You know, several years ago, the voters of New York State passed a $2 billion bond act. And I know Gilderland has benefited from that because I know that there was some money released, I think a year or two ago, with that. But you know, that money is not just for, and it's not limited to iPads or smart boards or computers, but it's also, it can also be funded to enhance security measures and security systems. So we're trying to force the governor to finally release those funds so that we can make the necessary important investment to all schools throughout the state of New York. I do appreciate the work that you're doing. I know that it is a difficult year, and with the with the uh, two percent property tax cap and the other unfunded mandates that the state has imposed upon local school districts throughout the years, it's difficult. But I think this year, in particular, the two percent really means two percent which is very important. So at this time, I guess I'll open it up for questions, if you have any. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you for coming and listening. I, I uh, want to talk about the uh, cap on building aid, which you covered well. But I uh, have served, and we are about to start up a committee again to work on uh, a new referendum. And I, I wrote down my thoughts, and I'll just read them, even though some of them are repeating uh, some of the ideas that you said. I, I said I'd like to encourage, and what I really mean is, is beg you to oppose the statewide cap on building aid. I know you know this district well, and I assume you know we have a superb assistant superintendent for business in Neil Sanders. And also, you probably don't know specifically, but would guess correctly that we also have an incredible director of facilities in Cliff Nooney who's back there. Both these guys work hard to keep our physical plant in top-notch shape and it really is well taken care of. One way this is done is by this carefully developed referendum put before our voters every five years. By doing it every five years we don't have uh, huge expenses that build up and we don't have to have as big a referendum as we might. 
The referendum proposals include, among other things, repairs to infrastructure, upgrades to learning spaces, and it also focuses on improvements to our security systems, which all of uh, our focus groups rightly consider primary importance in what we're doing. So we, we really do need that, and if we can get it through uh, the smart schools, that's great too. Members of the committee that will develop the referendum attend many meetings, come to an agreement on items for priority one, which are items that we have to do under this proposal, priority two, which means uh, if costs permit, we would include them in priority three. Uh, we're aware of a potential problem, but maybe next time if, if it's not critical yet. But obviously, an important part of each refer referendum is the cost, and it's significant. Finding a dollar amount that will meet our needs and which our taxpayers will see as justified. If we cannot depend on state funding for a given amount, then we can't possibly let our community know uh, how our school budget and their taxes will be impacted year to year, and that's not fair to anybody. I'm not sure voters would approve anything without that information. They, they trust us to be forthright with them, and they, they really shouldn't. Each year um, before elections, the candidates are asked by the Altamont Enterprise, what is your most important priority? And I think every, every board member probably says the children. But we also have to say we're concerned of our responsibility to, the, uh, to be stewards of the taxpayer dollars. We want, as do all concerned citizens, to create a proper learning environment for our students, our most valuable asset. We are not considered a needy district, as you know, so our funding would probably decrease significantly and by an unknown yearly amount. Under the proposed building aid cap, uh, this is what would happen to us. I know these are difficult times, but that uncertainty is no way to run a business or a state. Please, please do not let the statewide cap on building aid become part of the budget. An implementation of such a cap would serve no one well, would damage our trust with our community, which we treasure, and would create more long-term problems than it would solve. And I wish you good luck in trying to figure out <laughs> how well, to thank you. I started off with one of those points. That was the first that point of concern. Yeah. And it's... It, and it's about the the uncertainty. How do you go and develop your budgets without that certainty, knowing that most all of your aid, you know, it's depending on what the school runs show, right? Uh, what you have to, what the requirements, what the mandates are, and you know, looking at what the local tax levy is. So you have very strict parameters. And so when the executive in the state proposes, and he says that education is a top priority, and we have demonstrated in the legislature over the last few years, dealing with the issues of eliminating the gap elimination adjustment with trying to properly, finally bringing more equality into a very difficult formula that most everyone in the room, maybe one or two of you probably understand the school aid formula. If so, what are you doing here? You probably need to uh, launch a <laughs> rocket ship somewhere. And so um, it's, it's very difficult that without that certainty, and when the governor proposes these kind of caps or elimination, how do you go to the voters and say, oh, look, I need these improvements? We have. This, this is the Northeast. You know, we're not, we're not talking about building structures that are maybe, you know, in the, in the Sun Belt or in other more new developed states that, are constantly building new schools. We're in the Northeast. We have old infrastructure. We need to improve efficiencies. We need to upgrade facilities. We need to make the necessary security improvements uh, to our facilities. And so, and that all 
hinges on the voter. They have to say yes. And when the voter is already up to here, not up to here, but up to here, with, you know, the burden of the property tax levy, it's difficult for you. So my priority has always been, it's the workforce. Who is our workforce? Where is the future in our workforce? It's in the classroom. It's amongst these halls. And so we need to invest in that workforce. And how we do that is properly fund education in the programs in the infrastructure so I don't think because I quickly peeked at what the assembly is proposing and I'm sure if my colleague assemblywoman Fahey um, has a chance to uh, give her give you her remarks she can update you as well on the Assembly House, but I know in the Senate, the Senate Majority Conference is fixated on increasing education and using a realistic number. You know, I said about right around a billion dollars. The governor's got around 700 and so, 740, 760 or so. 3% above last year's record number. The Senate is proposing nearly 4%. Pretty significant. But we face some big kind of struggles and hurdles. The governor says $4.5 billion deficit. We believe if you stay within the spending cap that we have, a 2% spending cap, then we got about a billion six deficit. And we can make it up, and we've demonstrated with projection of revenues coming in that we can close the budget gap as well as properly fund the priorities that should be and one is education so I don't think it's going to be a real hard lift on this one issue to uh, reject and to have the also the uh, assembly majority conference on board as well because they love to boost up school aid as well and so uh, I think that it could be a win-win and when you have both houses on the same page it's a good thing anyone else do you have a prognosis on the timeliness of the budget well let me let me get my coin out. <laughs> Today we were, we were told that we will have plans to probably work through, you know, some of the, the um, religious holiday days. Not so much on Easter or on the, on the, on the Passover, but more so on, on days that uh, are going to come up to uh, to those holidays. I think we're going to have an on-time budget. But, you know, who's splitting hairs? Uh, one will say, a reporter may say, well, you were two hours late, so officially you were late. Meanwhile, we still did it when it was April 1st or, or March 31st. So, eh, I, or take I guess, a couple hours. I, I think one... And, should it be on time? Yes. Will it be on time? There's a real good possibility. Real good possibility. We'll work with that. I think so. <laughs> but that, it, it, it's good because last year, look what happened last year. How many times did we send you school runs? And they were estimated school runs, right? And how can then you really know what are you looking at? I mean, this is just pick a number out of the sky, I guess. Uh, this year is a little different. This year's a little different. So it's a good thing. Any other questions? Tim? Yeah, I don't have prepared remarks. <laughs> well, so I usually don't. <laughs> so. Now I wish I did. I'll be winging it a little bit. But um, 
I know there was a recent article in the Schenectady Gazette about a report on the uh, opioid uh, abuse problem, and uh, you had some very excellent quotes in, in there about that. And I guess when, when you look at the whole topic of school safety, um, I think that the opioid problem, the heroin problem, kind of rolls into that um, because it does have such a big impact on, on our schools and on our communities. Um, it seems like more and more uh, a week doesn't go by where you hear about some tragedy, uh, whether it's heroin or opioid abuse or this fentanyl uh, problem. So I, I guess I would just make a plea that maybe this can all get rolled in, and I know this is uh, a pet project of yours from what I read. Um, it's got to be public enemy number one. Uh, as much resources as possible that could be devoted to that, I think benefits our community, benefits our school, certainly benefits our students. And uh, when, when you hear talk of, I think last week there was a story about a $3.1 million like Skyway or Skywalk that uh, the governor was proposing, it, that's just way out of place. Uh, that's, that's misplaced priorities. I already spent that money so. today <laughs> <laughs> on another project I'm and another sure. initiative to tackle this, your, your question. Well, that's good. That's yeah. good, and hopefully there'll be more where that came from. So. Well, and, and thank you for bringing it up because, look, this is one of the biggest threats we have in society today, substance use disorder. It's just not heroin. We fought this battle even with cocaine, with crack, with meth, with, with other narcotics. Right now, the drug of choice because of the, the availability and, the, and how cheap it is, is heroin. But what we have discovered now is the opiates are so widely abused and they're abused across the spectrum in society. Really no age. I was with a gentleman today who started using narcotics at the age of 13. Teachers here, you have students 13 years younger or older, but he was using. And that, that habit developed to this disorder that got him in trouble with the law. So now he has this criminal record, and now he's sitting in jail at a young age. You know, he got through from 13 and 14 and 15. By the time he got to like 18 and out of school, um, he started doing more, causing more mischief and, and, and breaking the law. Where now he's sitting in jail, his whole life is before him, but his whole life is now wrecked. And he was bound by heroin. So today, the initiative that I laid out was to increase, which you're going to see more of, and, and, it, it, um, and I'm working with Albany County Sheriff Craig Apple. You know, we're truly blessed in Albany County to have the sheriff that we have, and we got some great sheriffs across the state of New York, but Sheriff Apple saw this coming three, four years ago. And he developed an initiative in the county jail that he coined or names it SHARP. And it, he designated a section of the jail for substance abuse disorder for treatment and recovery services and transitional counseling and services. Completely voluntary on the inmate and the population. But when jails are, the population of jail or prison, really about 68% of the population is repeat offenders. 50% of them 
are there because of substance, of use, substance use disorder and we're not offering services, we are really missing out. So today is an initiative of, of around $12.8 million that would allow jail-based services to be offered across the state because 51% of the jails do not have, in the state of New York, do not have any money to allocate towards these transitional services, which some of them, believe it or not, are students who just graduated. And they're looking, but yet their life is wrecked. Well, how can we build their life back up? So this became, I'm the chair of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Disorder in the State Senate and a co-chair of the Heroin Opiate Task Force in the State Senate. And I've gone around the state of New York. And really, when we know of terror threats, cybersecurity threats, we hear of, of uh, other type of threats from abroad, Domestically, this is, substance use disorder is our biggest threat in society. And we have to tackle it. And we have to invest the resources so that we can help those so vulnerable in society to have a life in recovery and sobriety, to get them to work, raise their families, and ultimately save taxpayer money because it costs us all dearly so thanks for bringing that up but without adequate prevention and the school districts play a huge huge role in that in security measures you have to take the multi-pronged approach of prevention treatment recovery services and enforcement those four prongs those are like the four legs of a chair to put to make a chair very stable you have to have the four legs so that someone sitting in it is going to feel secure well that security needs to be brought back into someone's life of stability to hold them up so that they can be self-sufficient chemically free chemical free less dependent on treatment more dependent on self-worth and knowing that they can overcome and have hope, it will do us all a world of good. So I thank you for that, and um, we need to do that. And I look forward to partnering with this school board, as well as many other school districts, on tackling this epidemic that we have. Not just heroin, or fentanyl, car fentanyl, but substance use disorder. So thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Tim, for that question, and thank you for that answer. I think it's really important that we keep on top of this. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much for coming in. You're welcome. Thank you. Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the uh, discussion of the draft budget, and I will turn it over to Murray. Um, I do want to say that Assembly Member Pat Fahey is also scheduled to come tonight. Uh, she texted me a little while ago saying she was coming from a couple of other events. So we'll start the discussion of the budget, but I told her that when she got here we would let her interrupt our proceedings and share her thoughts and answer our questions and then we'd go back to the business at hand if that is acceptable to everybody. Sure. So last week, uh, Tuesday, we presented the um, first draft of our budget for the 2018-2019 school year. And um, the materials have been posted to the website and board members have had those materials uh, for the past week. So tonight's the opportunity for the first round of questions and answers. And typically what we do is we begin with the board members and then we will open it up to uh, community members who may be here. And you can see we have a full complement of educational leaders who have played a part in developing this budget, who will, um, if they are so fortunate, be called to the podium to assist in the answering of questions. So we'll 
begin. Great. Um, do we want to start and go around the table, or is there anybody who's interested in beginning the discussion? Kathy? Um, I think I just had a, a more general question about, um, I think you had, you had said you were going to um, postpone discussion of the high school changes to tonight. Um, so I was just wondering um, what th the high school is down a position, and there are a number of um, courses that I think are down a section. Um, is that, and I just wondered what the impact was going to be. Of, of that change was going to be on the ability of um, our uh, high school students to get their um, courses that their schedules that they they desire and um, other um, impacts of that so there's a couple reductions in the high school um, uh, section of the budget there is a 1.0 reduction that's connected to electives and that is a mix of uh, half year and full year electives, so either 0.1 or 0.2. Um, if you will recall, when we first brought forward that proposal in the early stages, that uh, total reduction was 2.5 FTEs. Um, when we had to come to the uh, first draft here, I asked the high school leadership team to, instead of finding 2.5 FTEs of reduction to come up with 1.0 in the area of those electives. So the high school leadership team uh, sorted through the possibilities, and I believe the, the list that you have in front of you is the list that has the least impact uh, on opportunities for students next year. There's also two reductions, a, a percentage of an FTE in physical education and a, and a 0.1 in health education. Those are driven by enrollment at this point. Uh, those are numbers that we'll keep an eye on as the master schedule gets fully developed. Um, if our numbers hold, it should have no, those last two should have no impact on student scheduling, although it might create some challenges um, in uh, balancing when students have their science and when they have PE. So that's a master scheduling kind of thing. So. The goal here is to have as little impact as possible on students. So we can ask Tom to come up if you'd want more particulars on the list. Uh, sure. <laughs> that would that'd be fine since, since everyone's here. <laughs> Good evening. It really depends upon a particular class that you're talking about. Well, I just, I noticed that... Um, you have reductions in business, um, and I think that was that um, like uh, opportunities for students to um, take internships, that sort of thing. The business, the business classes, um, the reduction there, we are able to shift things around and cover that, so it really, it shouldn't impact any students as far as their selection to be able to do it. Some classes may have larger uh, class sizes than we would have normally run. So Tom, that was the point one school to work, I believe, is the one. Right, but we're, if, if Lori, I don't think Lori's here, but yeah, Lori's plan <laughs> was to move one of the teachers from one of the elective courses to cover the school to work course, and we would just have a higher class load in the electives. And um, we're still waiting on some of these numbers and scheduling. Okay, and um, I just might as well go through them since I have okay. you here. Um, so you have a um, a point two reduction in AP computer science. Right. So th does that mean that just fewer students will be able to enroll? I I think that impacted a few number nine students. Yeah, nine students. Nine students would not be able to Correct. enroll. So how for the, I'm, I'm sorry. I need to clarify from requests that are right now. Now, what happens when we run the schedule is not everybody will necessarily get their first selection because they may have a conflict with something else, mm -hmm. and they may decide, you know what, I want that something else more than this other thing. 
And so it's nine right now. It more realistically would be maybe like seven or six, some, somewhere along those lines. Okay, and um, you have, was it psychology? Um, point one reduction? Is yeah, and I think we can absorb that with higher class sizes. And I think a reduction of point two in art? Art is the same, th it, we would be able to, to have a little larger number in the studio art program. Okay, and um, point two in AP English? And uh, that again, we'd have higher class sizes. I don't think it impacted any students. Yeah. Okay, and then it was, um, the other was a, was a focus coordinator, right. point two? That, that was a position I think about two years ago that we added into the budget, two or three years ago. And that was to assist with some of the programming that Focus did, some of the volunteer things that they uh, participated in. Um, most board members go to the luncheon that they have. Uh, so that coordinator position would, would go away and it would fall on administration to kind of pick up that aspect of it split between administration and um, some that the TA does within um, the focus lounge area. Okay, when you, when you say higher class, um, how, like larger classes, I mean, are you, like, what would it, would it, would it have been, like, roughly before, and, and how much do you think the class size will increase? It depends on the class that you're talking about. I know Mr. Finzel has his chart popped up right in front of him, and I don't know... Um, <laughs> If he wants to talk about the AP, for example, what it what it would have been and what it goes to. Hello. So, for next year, I had planned on creating four sections of AP language, and again, because it's a very writing intense course, that would brought down the class average to 21, which I think that's appropriate with regard to research, along with good class ratios, to provide adequate time for students in writing instruction. So, given the the budget conditions, we can reduce our AP language sections by one section to three, which is what we currently have right now, and that would increase the class size from 21 to 28, 28 and a half. So in a writing intensive course, um, obviously that's not desirable because it's um, a lot of um, papers for, this, for the teacher to read and um, a lot of uh, maybe the kids need some assistance in, in their writing. Correct. So, so that's not a not a desirable. Um, well, I guess none of this is desirable. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that that seems particularly um, difficult if you're going from 21 student class to a 28 student class. Given the alternative, I would have to reduce uh, available options in English 12 electives. So I opted to increase class size rather than to remove uh, options for students to choose in their senior year. Kind of a triage. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. And, and I think that's pretty consistent throughout the departments is that's the way we would look at it. Rather than uh, remove options for students, we would rather at least offer those programs, uh, but there, there may be more students in them. Okay. Well, thanks for the information. You're welcome. So I noticed um, we had Assembly Member Pat Fahey come in. If we want to take a break from the questions, um, Kathy, we will come back to you if that's okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> and then invite uh, Assembly Member Fahey to the microphone if you're ready. <laughs> thank you for joining us tonight. Good evening, and thank you. And sorry if I am interrupting. I, I oh, apologize. Not at all. Um, it's, uh, it's been a very uh, long day, and I also just realized as I was walking in that I was supposed to make some copies of uh, the latest press release. I was able to send it to the superintendent um, and neglected to make copies of, uh, um, just to back up for a second, we just released our Assembly's One House uh, Budget Resolution, um, which is in response to the governor's proposed budget. Uh, very generally, uh, we think it's um, it's pretty positive on a, on a lot of fronts, but particularly uh, on the education front. I can, um, if, if there is a few minutes, I'd be happy to run through it and I will leave what is unfortunately my only copy. I have um, a number of copies of the um, 
uh, the overall spending plan that mentions a few pieces of education, and I can leave those, and you can decide um, how to distribute them. I don't, uh, I don't think I have enough um, for for everybody here. But uh, do you want me to just hand them back, or just Pat? Leave them I or? have um, what you sent to me. I can easily just email this to. Uh, Everyone at the table and the administrators okay, and those who are in the audience, if you're and I, interested. And I apologize because I really had intended to make copies, and it's been a um, uh, it's been a very hectic day. Aside from releasing this one house budget, um, we also reappointed uh, two of the regents today. So we had the regents' votes. We did a lot of women's health issues. It has been a whirlwind, and this is my fifth event this evening. And I <laughs> I just left there at uh, uh, after six o'clock tonight. So um, it's. Uh, uh, it's what we call a session day, so it is a lot of juggling. Um, so I'm um, forgive me, but I'm winging it. Although I feel like I do that most of the days. Um, so Pat, we can also post this to our website. Yes, for those and who are really, here. my apologies. I so really no had, worries about that. Okay, so it's, I'll just I'll pass a few of these. Um, well, I'll let you decide. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not picking who gets them. But this is what I'm going to just use right now is, um, is that press release is more about the budget overall and it's just a summary the entire budget is online and um, if I, I don't think I shared that part with you superintendent um, uh, but the entire budget is online I'm just going to give you the snapshot of education and again I just I just want to caution um, we've worked really hard to get to this place. As you know, um, uh, this is, I, I, I guess I should just start with, uh, this is my sixth budget, uh, my, my um, sixth year in the assembly. And this is the first year of my six years uh, that we have not started with a multi-billion dollar surplus. This is the first year we have started with a multi-billion dollar surplus deficit, uh, the $4.4 billion that you had heard about a lot this year. Uh, now, we have come back and said that we think we're, uh, we have $750 million more on that. There's been a, a slightly better news on a couple of health issues uh, with federal funding. Um, so we think we're in a little bit better uh, shape, but we in the Assembly are also proposing to raise some fees. You've probably heard some criticisms of those already. Um, and uh, and we are looking at a number of optional uh, tax reform pieces to address this $14 billion deficit that we anticipate with the new federal tax reform. So to say that it is a fluid situation would honestly be an understatement. I think this is one of the more, most complex budgets uh, that we have proposed. And um, while I think there's a lot of good news in the Assembly's resolution, uh, I don't want to kid anybody that it will be, uh, this is just the opening fight. The, um, uh, the Senate will be offering their resolution. My understanding is they will not be proposing fees, so they don't have quite the cushion that we are looking at. Um, but, but where we go from here is often usually somewhere in the middle. Uh, traditionally, the Assembly comes in with a higher number on most education um, uh, programs. Uh, and then we end up somewhere a little bit down from that. So I just, uh, uh, so I, I think it's encouraging, at least on this front, but I, I guess I just want to, I, I try not to sugarcoat, sometimes I think I should a little more, um, but I, I don't want to overstate that uh, we have a, a tough few weeks ahead of us. And we will do all we can. I mean, certainly, um, while generally we're getting some decent feedback on this, uh, it's not it's not what anybody had hoped for so I'm not trying to say this there's nothing wonderful here you still have a lot of work cut out for you and we recognize that we don't have the budget runs uh, so we recognize that as well but I'm just gonna if, if it's okay I'll just walk through a few of these um, so we're including uh, 36 billion for, for school aid what that includes is uh, an increase of 1.5 billion or 5.9 percent over um, last the last school year, so that's a pretty big number. If you uh, think the governor of, of the governor's number, which was at three percent, but the rest of state government is held under two percent, so that's a pretty decent number. Um, with regard to um, where we are with the executive budget, that one point five is is almost double. It's about uh, maybe a little over double. It's an additional investment of eight hundred and forty million, and again, this will be in the uh, in the press release. Um, in terms of foundation aid, 
uh, which I know can have a mixed uh, uh, mixed impact here. But of that 1.5, 1.2 million of that 1.5 will be in foundation aid. The foundation aid will um, bring all schools to at least 50% of what they were owed on, on the foundation aid. And, uh, and it also includes within that 1.2, there is included money for community schools, uh, 50 million, but there's additional uh, money for community schools as well, as well as a million and a half for uh, uh, mental health. There's also a, a relatively, well, I think it's a, a new program, um, seven million for supportive schools to help implement the dignity for all students. As you know, a lot of that has been very controversial. The numbers have been, um, uh, not all school districts have been complying with it, so it's an effort to help school districts. And as you know, the reporting requirements have changed on that. And I certainly have a bill on that, the Jacobs Law that you may have heard of. And uh, while that is not moving, this is a, uh, an effort to try to, uh, to address some of that. There's also uh, an additional 50 million for pre-K and um, 15 million for English language learners along with homeless uh, students. Uh, that, um, you know, you'd have to tell me how much that may or may not help help you. We've restored a million and a half on adult literacy. And what I hope will be decent news for you, we have rejected um, uh, the, um, the proposals, the, the governor's proposals to reject the, the state caps, the reimbursement caps on transportation, on building aid, and on BOCES aid. Uh, so we think we, we didn't accept uh, virtually any of that. I think I named them all. Um, and we, um, sorry, I'm going back to an old, a letter, um, the upstate, Democratic, the upstate Democratic Caucus also weighed in to try to fight some of those changes. So let's see, it was the, um, uh, it was the, the BOCES um, cap. We also um, eliminated the cap on the retirement, the teacher's retirement fund. Um, and uh, if I'm saying that right. And then, um, let's see, the, uh, I think I've named them all. I feel like I'm... I feel like I'm missing one, but it's it's building aid, both C's and uh, transportation, and special uh, education. The summer, I, I knew, I, yeah, the summer school special ed. Yes, we have um, fully restored that. Uh, that was 34 million. Uh, the teachers resource centers have been fully restored. Uh, the money for the 4201s, I know that doesn't impact you as much, but that was uh, that was fully restored. We also put in $2 million for museum education. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm just flipping through here on a few others. I think that is about, that's some of the major ones, but where we could, we restored it. Again, um, that could set us up still for a fight, but at least, at least it, it gets across the um, uh, the desire that we are rejecting a number of the governor's proposals there. I'm just flipping through a few of my other. Um, uh, we also did pretty well on higher education, and I know that is impacting um, a number of students, particularly with the Excelsior program. Um, so the we've done quite well there. I think that about wraps up the bulk of, uh, of where we are on funding. And of course, we don't have the school runs just yet. I don't know if there's any quick questions in response to that. Again, um, this has to be balanced against the entire budget. This has to be balanced against the fees. Um, those fees are controversial. If the Senate really fights and rejects all of those, uh, the main fee, which is controversial, I'm not going to kid anybody. Um, we just a year ago, we passed transportation um, uh, the, the Uber Lyft, the uh, TNCs, Transportation Network Companies. We authorized those in New York for the first time. This year we are coming right back. Um, amazing how fast a year can be. Uh, but there will be a fee in uh, in New York City of every ride. We'll have a $2.75 uh, additional fee on it. And throughout upstate, it will be a dollar fee. Uh, those fees um, are helping. Uh, a lot of that is going to go to roads and bridges as well as upstate transit but it's those types of fees um, uh, that you will see to try to, to try to raise some revenues and keep the pressure off of, of other programs. So 
uh, whether those prevail. If none of if if some of these proposals do not prevail, that changes the overall number. But the bottom line is for um, it is overall 1.5 billion, and I do hope that will help. Um, I think it goes in. Um, I want to say it's um, we retained the. Is it 100 percent hold harmless? What, what have we had before? I'm sorry. I'm drawing. I'm suddenly drawing a blank, and I, I didn't bring my other notes in with me. What do we normally do on the formula? We have 100 percent hold harmless, or is it 90 percent? I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. And my other my other notes of, um, from a couple of days ago are are uh, are in the car. Uh, <laughs> but there are um, <laughs> lots of notes and lots of papers. I was trying. Um, uh, but there, there is the hold harmless, so I would like to think that uh, we, we won't see anything worse. Uh, I, know, I know the formula uh, throughout my district has varying impacts, uh, but overall we, we think this is good news. We are going to work very, very hard to hang on to it. So, I, sorry I raced through that, and I'm very sorry I don't have paper in front of any of you. Uh, my fault. I was handed this at five o'clock and raced out, or raced into conference and raced from there to these events. Uh, I was going to try to get some copies, uh, but you will get it electronically at least, and hopefully share. And then, of course, the whole budget is also online if uh, to read all the nitty gritty details of this. But hopefully, this gives you the broad picture. I'm happy to take any questions. Obviously, we wish it were better news, but there is uh, lots of. Lots and lots of trade-offs. Already we're being pressured now to go back at the direct care and uh, those serving the disabled. Um, lots and lots of pressure on housing. Uh, you read a lot about uh, NINSHA, the, um, uh, the New York City Housing Authority. Um, already uh, lots of fallout that we didn't do enough in the budget. Uh, so already tonight we had a slightly longer conference than anticipated. Um, because already there's a, a lot of fallout from members on what we didn't do. Uh, so it is, um, quite frankly, I think, given all of the needs um, between uh, transportation, the health care, which is a continuing problem, uh, education, and then the, the tax issue, is a, uh, it's a ticking time bomb, quite frankly, uh, especially if, if we really do think we're going to see $14 billion less next year because of this... Um, uh, SALT, the state and local uh, tax deduction, the loss of that over $10,000. Uh, as much as I was dreading this year's budget, I'm beginning to think a lot of this is really coming home to roost next year when we start to see the loss of those, um, those dollars within the state. Uh, so overall, um, I, I think it's good news so far, uh, but I don't delude myself. We have a, we have a tough few weeks ahead of us. Um, and um, uh, and, and I should also add, obviously, for uh, those with the foundation aid, um, uh, the capital has been jammed to the gills these last few days with people. Uh, obviously, the, there were those who wanted two and a half billion in increases and two billion in increase. So, um, so um, <laughs> we'll be getting lots of lumps over the next few weeks of people who are are terribly dissatisfied. But we do think that we've come in almost double where. Uh, uh, where we uh, started in January with the, the governor's proposal, and now it's just a matter of holding on to it. I don't know if there's any other uh, questions on that. Um, happy Barbara? Yeah, thank you. For if, if appropriate. I'm not trying to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming. And, and Absolutely, and thank, thank you for having me. And by the way, the I'm sorry. Of good news that both you and George have shared in the sense that both of you, the Senate and the Assembly, are proposing at least a little more aid than, than the governor. Uh, this is a non-education question that you just brought up, the, um, the state and local taxes. Just for my own general education, how does that impact state tax revenue? I see how it would impact an individual, but how does it impact this, the state? In very rough numbers, DOB, the, um, the governor's division of budget, is estimating that next year, because uh, you're capped, and especially in this region, I think this region is going to be particularly hard hit because we have such a, um, a high, we don't have uh, as much um, poverty and we don't have the uber wealthy in this in the capital region. We really have middle class. We have a lot of dual income uh, uh, folks. And we, you know, we're New York. We have higher property taxes, even if they have been capped for the last uh, five or six, seven years. 
um, but because the, the SALT, the state and local tax deduction on your federal returns will be capped at $10,000, if, you, if your state and local taxes as well as your property taxes put you in a $15,000 range or $20,000 range, you can't deduct that, that uh, additional $5,000 or $10,000. Anything over $10,000 uh, will not be deductible. The governor's office has estimated that that will um, cost this state, that means you'll be paying more federal taxes then, and that will cost this state $14 billion. And as I tell people, even in New York, that's real money. That's real money. That does make the difference. Uh, so by next year, um, those numbers um, uh, can really come back to bite us, uh, particularly when you um, think of education, when you think of some of the um, things on the horizon with, uh, with health care. Um, we also have one of the highest health care costs in the country. Uh, so it's, um, it's, it's some of those numbers that, um, and, and I, you know, we're not keeping up. We're not, um, I don't think we're going to be able to respond fast enough. As you know, uh, the governor, and I think it's to his credit, quite frankly, he is proposing optional um, where you can switch from a um, uh, the income tax to the payroll taxes. Uh, the businesses can switch to try to protect the individual who may be harmed by these, uh, this, this loss of these deductions. Uh, we are also proposing uh, some charitable uh, contributions, and I, we were going to do it in education, and um, we dropped some of these in the last couple of days. But we are uh, allowing some charitable foundations to be set up again to protect to protect the tax base and allow individuals to donate to help their own um, protect their own income tax liabilities. Um, and I. We, we had one set up for education, and I don't, um, I'm sorry, these, we, we get briefed rather regularly, and there was a, a couple of things that didn't make it in the final assembly one house resolution, and I think that may have been it, and I apologize, I'm forgetting. Uh, we had a couple of um, charitable, again, to, to help school districts as well as help the taxpayer to give to charitable contributions such that they wouldn't lose it to additional federal taxes. And I just, um, I'm going to have to check on that to see if it was retained in the, uh, um, in the final budget. It may not have been. Uh, but you, you will probably see us come back. My guess is um, this is a year where uh, we will continue to be working on these tax reform issues to try to protect the individual taxpayer as much as possible, plus try to protect um, schools. Uh, but right now, um, the liability has clearly gone up on the taxpayer with this uh, federal tax reform, particularly for those higher middle income earners, the, the dual households. Just dual to income. call up, sure. I may be obtuse here, but I still don't see how the state is losing money. I can see how the individual taxpayer, because you only have that $10,000 deduction, but how is the state losing the money? That You keep saying that the state is losing all this money. I can see how individual taxpayers are losing it, and collectively, you know, if you say that, but how does the state actually get impacted? It, um, like, you know, for money to give back to us. That's the part I don't understand. Uh, okay, I I see where you're. Yes, I, I see where I'm. I'm maybe oversimplifying this. Um, some of it is one the loss overall uh, to uh, to the individual, and then um, your state. Let, let me think. So then your you lose the ability um, because our tax ref our state taxes are so tied to the federal taxes. Oh, I was so good on this a couple of months ago, and now I've been <laughs> caught up in the final numbers. Um, our state taxes are tied to your federal taxes. Um, and let me think of how the estimate is $14 billion. Um, I, I see where I've, I've probably glossed over a step, and I'm, I'm going to have to... Um, I'm going to have to get back to you on it. Uh, it, it. Although some of it is just honestly, it's not even so much that um, 
is uh, that individuals can be at risk of just paying more taxes, but then worried about that middle class flight from the state, because especially those who may have two state pensions, you know, you can go to F Florida and not pay on that pension. So some of it is the, the flight and uh, then the taxpayer upheaval about not, uh, not being able to deduct their full property taxes. But in terms of the dollars, how exactly does it, how do we calculate, and there was a very simple calculation they used to come up with the 14 billion, and I apologize, it's just, I'm not thinking on my feet. Um, but there was, because I followed, I was following this very closely. Lately, I've been enmeshed in just in what we're in advocating to get the numbers in the actual one house and not focused on the revenue side. Uh, so I, I will follow up with you, and I'll try to get you that, that information. To say it's been fluid is, uh, is really an understatement. Even these charitable um, deductions that we were looking at for uh, school districts and even for uh, local municipalities, and I think all of those have dropped out in the last couple of days. So, um, so it's been hard to keep up with which version. Uh, you know, I'll be home looking at it again tonight as well. I've got the whole book. Uh, so I apologize if I can't. It, it's a it's a simple explanation on how they came up with the 14 billion, and and I'll think of it as soon as I walk out. <laughs> so, Thank you. yeah. But but either way, some of it is just the the risk and the the penalizing of um, of the blue states, if you will. Uh, those of us that spend more on education and uh, and that do tend to have the the higher property taxes. So it's. Uh, there, there will be continued efforts, and I think it will go on past the budget process. You know, even if we adopt the budget at the end of this month, we will still be looking at the tax code and trying to protect the uh, the taxpayer. And as you know, there's also um, a slew of lawsuits over this um, because it is it is also a double taxation because generally you are able to deduct all of your state and local taxes. Uh, going back to 1913 or 1930, whatever the, is that, uh, I think it goes back to, um, uh, there's a president that was quoted, maybe it was FDR, that you should not be taxed, you should not have to pay your federal taxes and then pay again on that same amount on your, your federal taxes. So there has been, um, you know, uh, decades uh, of, um, uh, of precedents that have been tossed out the window on this. So uh, I, I think we need to move as aggressively as we can, uh, but there is also the worry that whatever New York and others do to try to circumvent the, the federal tax reform, uh, that Congress will come back and just change that. I think it will take a while, um, uh, but, uh, but the intent is to be as aggressive as possible. Other questions? I just have one. Um, you mentioned an increase in funding for mental health which I think is critically important that people have access to those services. And I was hoping maybe you can elaborate on the use of those additional funds. It's, um, it's seven million. Right now it's generally just listed as, you know, improving school climate safety and implementing Dignity for All Students Act, which was something passed a few years ago. Um, it is targeted at elementary secondary. And it is about um, uh, to, uh, um, provide the more supportive environment, uh, uh, free, you know, discrimination, intimidation, taunting, harassment, and bullying. It is to try to get at that. Now, $7 million is not a big number statewide. Uh, as you know, in response to the latest massacres, uh, there are also a number of school safety proposals. Um, we are seeing more of those in the Senate proposal, and right now you are not seeing those in the Assembly proposal. I think as we conference over the next few weeks, you will see a little bit more on school safety, although, and while I think there is a need, uh, even just for capital money, um, uh, for, for some school, for increased school safety measures, I, I will tell you I have been on record saying I'm not going to support those until we also see some, uh, some of the gun safety measures packaged. In other words, what I don't want to see is that, um, uh, those who are only talking about school safety, which we have heard a lot of in the in the uh, state senate, um, I, I don't think those can be standalone. I, I I recognize the need, and I'm happy to support some increased funding there because I do think there's a need, uh, including just for capital investments for more cameras, uh, some metal detectors, whatever whatever school districts decide they need. Um, but I don't want 
uh, what we have seen happen too often, and that is that we think we take a vote and say, well, we're going to give you a few more million more on school safety and abdicate our, uh, what I believe is a need to also address some gun violence issues. Uh, so, so while an, um, I haven't seen the final uh, uh, Senate one house proposal, they have not, um, the Senate has not issued theirs and I, and I missed uh, Senator Amador's presentation, but I think you will see, in addition to some of the mental health monies, you will see some around school safety um, uh, and, and maybe some mental health uh, issues addressed with that. Uh, the, the only concern you'll see coming out of our side is that it uh, uh, a general opposition until it's packaged with more aggressive mem uh, uh, more aggressive measures. So I um, uh, listen. There's there's always more we can do. There's a lot that we've done. Again, increased dollars, uh, which is in the uh, the sheet that I did pass out on opioid and drug treatment uh, and mental health. I think goes right with that. Um, but uh, uh, the needs, um, I quite frankly don't believe we're even beginning to address the need that's out there, and I'm happy to take back, you know, happy to listen to any additional needs here. But I, I will say, everywhere I go, doesn't matter what the school district is, we are hearing a, um, a, a real uh, outcry for, uh, for mental health um, dollars and services and counselors, guidance, um, social workers, right across the board, and I have to assume that's where you are heading and, and noting the need here as well. Yep. Yeah, I, and I commend you for it. I, I know uh, we did put some money in last year for school health clinics, uh, and I know a number of schools, uh, while they may not be doing full-fledged school clinics, they are looking at school mental health clinics, like Bethlehem, for instance, I think just last year opened up a a partial one, again, just to uh, as just for mental health and just to address the family needs there. So I know some are going with full blown health clinics, and others are just trying to zero in there. So I know there is some money. I don't think we've put any additional increases there this year, but I'm happy to check back on any of that. Yeah, thank you. I I think are we trying to move towards a, a clinic? So yeah. we have in our budget thirty five thousand uh, dollars because the capital district. BOCES is partnering with Parsons to help establish mental health clinics in schools. So we will be, uh, we're doing the homework on that right now. So it's a BOCES service, um, and we're hopeful because it is a need that we have. Uh, yes, I know for human services in general, um, to just even address some of the minimum wage increases they're seeing on some of the human services across the board, we, we do have an additional $23 million to help keep pace with those salaries. And I uh, just saw the head of Parsons in Northern Rivers uh, this morning, actually, at a, at a press event. Uh, so we did address their needs, their request. So hopefully that will help with the monies you're seeking uh, to go into partnership with them. They are really one of the leading providers, and, and to their credit, Bill Getman has been one of the foremost spokespeople uh, on, on this issue. Um, he's in the capital as much as I am uh, in terms of advocacy. So, uh, so I know we've met the, the overall state need, that they, the, the number they were looking for, the $23 million. How much that addresses the $35,000 grant, I don't know specifically, but we can certainly check on that. Um, but yeah, they're they're um, uh, they were out they were out there in force again today, dozens and dozens uh, on on just these issues, which which is important, quite frankly, because I see it all tied together. Can't talk about school safety if you're not going to talk about mental health and not talk about the social emotional needs of the of the students. Thank you for that. Are there any other questions or comments? Well, thank you again for coming in, and thank you for all you do on our behalf. We really appreciate it. Thank you, and, and I apologize that I couldn't make it last week. We really have had some very, very late nights, and please forgive me if I run out again today. I, I, we are passing um, some of the resolutions tomorrow, some of the, uh, uh, if not all of it, so I've, I do have a lot of homework. Um, <laughs> we um, support homework here. Pat. We support homework, <laughs> yes. So, um, but I am, please, I'm um, always happy to take questions, always happy to be a resource, and, and uh, as we move forward, always happy to come back. So thank you for your advocacy. I think it's wonderful when you send the students up 
um, at, and every year we meet with the students. So it, it does matter, and I think it's a wonderful experience for them. So please keep working with all your associations, whether it's the school boards, the administrators' associations, the superintendents. Um, the superintendents um, uh, had just pulled me off the floor today on the, um, the 529 deduction, and that's going to be a very <clears> – <throat> I didn't even mention it, but that will be um, – uh, that deduction will be one of the more controversial items that we face in the next two weeks. Uh, I don't know if you know what I'm referencing there. 529 the, plans that you can use for charter schools? And yes, schools, yeah. uh, yes, and the, um, so it's one to get on your radar screen. Um, uh, that too will be costly if we allow it to be used for all private and uh, charter schools as opposed to just public schools. So that is one, I know the superintendents are already way out there and that is something you might wanna be weighing in on too because all of those have costs if we, uh, uh, if we let that be broadened beyond public schools and beyond public education. So it's, uh, uh, the privatization issues are, are tricky ones and very costly. So, um, uh, so I, but I encourage you on all of these issues to keep working with your associations and the PTAs. It, you know, all of them are very, very important voices so that we can hold on to as many of these dollars as possible. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for having me, and I really appreciate you allowing me to interrupt like this. Thanks so Thank much, you. Pat. Thank you. Okay. Yes. I have a question. Barbara. You know, oftentimes when we have our meetings, we have public comment at the beginning so yep. people can go home. Do you think we could interrupt our sharing the, and let the people speak first? I have no problem with that. Does any, Can I just Kathy? ask one question first? Because I think it might be relevant to public comment. What are, what are our, can you just remind me what our class size guidelines are for um, for uh, the various grades? Like, I know we have a, a range of guidelines and I just, I can't remember exactly what it is. So uh, K2 is 18 to 23. Grades 3, 5 is 21 to 25. 6, 8, I'm going to forget, is 20. Damien, I'm looking at you. <laughs> Mike Laster, do you know? Uh, no. But <laughs> and then high school is 15 to 30. That's in our contract. Okay. 24 to 26. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. 9, 12, 26, 27. Thank you. <clears throat> So I know um, I know there's been a lot of questions about class size at the elementary level based on the budget that we've released last week. So why don't I anticipate some questions and and just talk through um, where we are with all of that? So I want to again say that the budget we released last week is the first draft of the budget, and the class sections are set strictly using the numbers that I just defined, um, particularly at the elementary level, the K-2 being uh, 18 to 23, and 3-5 being 21 to 25. So Neil Sanders each year does a projection of our subsequent year enrollment, and for this first draft of the budget, we strictly use those guideline numbers. We don't uh, massage them in any way to make class sizes bigger or smaller. We simply divide the number of children by the number of sections. So you'll see if you looked at the presentation, there are five classrooms across the, the district um, where we have, uh, we were either at the upper guideline or we're very close to it. All of those classrooms are classrooms that we will be watching over the next several weeks to see if we need to go up to another section. This is no different than we have done this any year before. We've always just used the strict um, uh, guideline numbers divided, uh, using to divide in the total number of students. So should we have more students who come into those classrooms, that's when we use our unassigned FTEs. We have five unassigned FTEs built into the classrooms, uh, into the budget. So for those families who are concerned about kindergarten and third grade at Gilderland, I understand those are very close or at the upper guidelines. Those will be one of the first areas that we'll address. So please don't panic and worry. Uh, we totally understand that at this point, it looks like we've made cuts. They are not cuts. We are simply using the math as it exists at this point, 
and we'll be watching those uh, classrooms as we go forward. But that's what the unassigned FTEs are for. Kathy, was I anticipating your question? Oh, yeah. I, okay. just, I just wanted to remind myself of what the, the guidelines actually were, because I know I had that information at one point, but I just wanted to. I, I think it just bears reminding. So one other thing I'll say about this is each year we put together a frequently asked question document following this meeting, and we will do a long explanation uh, of what I just said about class sizes and how we determine them and how it gets resolved as the budget unfolds. Um, so I guess if there's no objection, we can have the people who are here tonight ask their questions and then come back to the board. Okay. So if there is anybody, I ask you to just come up to the microphone and say your name and then go ahead with your question. Does anybody have questions that's here? <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, again, thanks for your time. My name is George Slingerland. Uh, we have two children at Altima Elementary, and uh, Dr. Wiles did mention Gilderland, but Altamont has a class that's, that's on the edge too. And just before we talked about the guidelines, um, and there's a range, I think, for a particular reason. And it seems like in the discussion just now, and with what happens, you guys don't really look at the range, you look at the upper edge. No, we look at the lower end too. Except you say, you had just mentioned before, that the ranges are 21 to 25. But what about, so what about the 21? Why is it when it only reaches the 25, does another class get considered? So right now, for example, let's just talk about Altamont. That's okay. also on the list, so you know. I just mentioned Gilderland because I do. We I know have it's on the many list. letters from Gilderland this week. So right now, second grade in Altamont has three sections, and the proposal for third grade is to cut that to two. Okay, the three sections have 49, which is one student away from already hitting that upper limit. Guideline. Guideline right. is important, not limit. So we're it's already guideline. for the upper limit of your guideline, the upper end of your guideline mm -hmm. range. So you're already for over the lower end of your guideline. Okay. And before you said there's this is the, the first draft and it's very preliminary and nobody should worry about it right now. But I think that everybody's here from Altamont and Gilliland does have concern because we just this just happened last year and we spent two meetings you called special meetings there's all types of concerns in this same evidence the same numbers were before everyone when there was still time to do something about it and nothing was done about it so then you introduce a new set of logistical problems which I'm sure everybody remembers those meetings that it can be fixed now so the numbers are there, and I don't think it's difficult when we sat here last year. You also mentioned, and I don't remember exactly the numbers, but there's also a factor, an average that's used for kids that come into the district from the period where classes are actually set through the end of the year. So if, if you're in a situation where you're one student away from hitting the very upper end of your guideline prior to any of that information. It just seems silly that we're doing it again. So I guess my question is, if the numbers before you right now present the way that they do, and if you want to take it a step further, Altamont right now has the fourth grade section has two sections, but right now fifth grade has three. So it's a very easy decision for everybody to cut that fifth grade section to carry the two over from fourth to fifth. Why isn't it as easy a decision to carry three sections forward? Because none of these decisions are easy at this point. We, we don't have all the data that we need. I mean, I think one of the things we need to do is actually understand what our revenue is. We, we've just heard from both our senator and our assemblyman that we don't have a state budget. So part of what we're doing at this early state, 
of the of the development is making an estimate of the money we have to spend. So at this point, we can't spend money that we don't have. Or conversely, we need to look at other parts of the district where we would make reductions. So we're balancing all of those things at this point. And I guess what I would say, silly or not, is that we're leaving our options open in March. Understood. But if we get into April, and believe me, we all clearly remember <laughs> the conversations from the fall, and I don't think we want to repeat that again. I'm sure that's the case. Right. And so I, I'm, I think a lot of us are here urging you to consider that that's something that really should be at the, the forefront of everybody's minds. Because to me, the way that classrooms are set up and proposed to be set up, and, and I apologize that I don't know, I'm not as familiar with the Gilliland numbers, but it, it, it just seems like a no-brainer as far as proposal goes. You're losing a section, you might need another section. It's a, a net zero change, or could be a net zero change at Altamont. When you're teetering, on a third grade section that if there are two sections before you allow that average factor of students that come into the district if it's three if it's four you're already at 27 and 28 or 26 and 27 and and it's just it's not it's not desirable and I'm not sure I understand what the average factor is Last year, when we were here talking about the numbers, somebody mentioned, I don't remember who mentioned it, but there was clearly an average factor that somebody discussed about the average number of students that would come into a grade level in our district. So if that happens, I remember it clearly. I don't remember what the number was, but there is a number of students that come in after that decision is made you're just you're setting your we're setting ourselves up to be in a similar situation as we were last year when I don't think it needs to be I don't know that there is an average I mean we do get more students who come we also get students who leave between now and then I'm especially in grades one and above K they're all incoming and we can't necessarily predict what buildings and what grades those students will come in. So I'm reflecting back to Altamont, and we received four new students in the last week of August, which put us over those upper guidelines, which we could not have predicted. So our, our goal is to have, well, we would prefer not to wait to the first week of August, but the first week of August is really the point at which we need to decide how many sections we're going to have. Because in that, in that week, we send letters to families to say, you know, your child is going to have, you know, Mrs. Jones for kindergarten or first grade or second grade. And the last thing we want to do in the third week of August is, is say, well, no, sorry, you're not. We're going to create another section, and now your teacher is TBD. So we really like to make those decisions by um, August 1st, 2nd, somewhere in that neighborhood. So children come and children go. Um, we forget the part about students leaving often. But your, your points are very well taken, and I think we're all keenly aware of the priority that our community puts on class sizes in this district. And um, I just would say we're balancing lots of priorities and lots of needs at this point in the budget development process. Uh, nobody wants your job. It's not enviable. <laughs> Anybody's job. I'm just, uh, you already acknowledged the, you know, the writings on the wall. So I, I think it's something that we need to pay careful attention to because nobody wants to do what we did last year again. It wasn't good for you guys. It wasn't good for parents. It wasn't good for the students. So it seems like it, we're in a, a prime position now to really think about it, to avoid it going forward again. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. So we won't. Are there any questions? So, 
Um, my name is Erica Smith, and I have two children at Pine Bush Elementary School. And um, I have a question about the reading support that we're potentially losing. So does that mean that we're going to have no reading program at Pine Bush, or are we have it? What we have there is still going to be there. Or is everything going to be taken away? There is no, no. We're not taking any reading support away. Okay. That's a request for additional reading support that that, we're just not that at this point we are unable to afford. Right. I just want to make sure we weren't losing no. what we had. No, okay. and that's the top of the restore list or the okay. add list. That's so what I wanted to make sure that yes. we were losing what we had. I do have a concern when we're talking about building aid money, and I know I keep bringing this up. And I know that you you have this thirty five thousand that's not going to be there. But when I read the enterprise article, we're in the building. Uh, we're in that business of education. And when I read that, we seem to be doing land acquisition, and that's not what you're in the business of. So when I read that there is a real estate transaction between the library and the school of vacant land, I wonder why. Because when I hear about building or land caps and building aid caps and we're trying to get real estate money or money from taxes, I'm wondering why we're not using that money or putting that land up for sale. Because if that land is vacant and we're about to have to pay taxes on it, and that was the reason why we had to transfer the land, that seems like we were shortchanging ourselves. So my question is, as a district, that land is vacant. We have to be able to maintain that land. So are we paying then to um, do groundskeeping on it? Are we carrying insurance on that land? Because if somebody goes on it, it's vacant, and somebody gets hurt, are we liable for that? What is the liability of that land? And then what is the zoning of that land? Could we have made money off of that if it was zoned business? Is it zoned residential? It is on Western Ave. It has frontage right on Western. So what is the retail or the resale value of that? Could we have made it if it was sold? What would have we gotten back in school taxes? I just heard up here we don't want to waste taxpayer money. And we have... 35000 on a cobblestone house that we can't find the title for, that we can't use, that yearly we patchwork on, and then land that we're holding on to. So how much do we do that we say we don't want to waste taxpayer money, we're in a fiscally tight environment, and we could have had tax revenue on? So what, 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 what is our tax liability? What is our, what do we spend? We have to be spending money on that. I know it's not sitting there uninsured. And Neil, can I invite you to respond? Yeah. Um, it is insured. Um, we do have insurance on it. It's, it costs a dollar for the insurance policy. So um, that's what it was with the library, and that's what it will be with, with, the, school with the school district as well. And I, I just want to assure you that the Business Practices Committee took a very close look at the agreement between the district and the library because I share all of your concerns. We made sure to write into that agreement that we would not have any additional expenses on account of us agreeing to hold this land for the library. So in terms of maintenance, that will still be the responsibility of the library as well as a lot of other fees that are associated with maintaining that land. It was also stated that it's supposed to be used for educational purposes. So I'm just concerned that another building, another lot that we're supposed to be using for educational purposes, it's vacant land. So unless we are doing a surveying team out there, I'm wondering what we're going to do with students out on vacant land. Just like the cobblestone house is supposed to be used for educational purposes, and it's not being used for that. So we're holding property that we're not using. And then I hear the lecture constantly that we have to be fiscally responsible for the taxpayer. As my as students are not getting what they need, as we hear just now, well, we have to, don't be silly. We need another classroom. And we're and it's you're kind of like laughing at our concerns when I I, I see. 
and, it, and it's not funny. There are, there's real concerns. I should probably oh, also I mention, to... I don't know if, if people know that um, we own the land that the library is on. So, I mean, we we have, we already own, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what the arrangement is, but I know we own the land. Yeah. Yeah, it's a school district, uh, public library is chartered that way, so the school district owns the library building itself and the land that it sits on, uh, the original building. Uh, so it does have a linkage to the school district. It's the school district public library. They had a library had purchased two additional parcels, which they've been holding on to, and were tax exempt until recently, when they were told that the exemption wouldn't be continued. But the school district can own the property, and it automatically becomes tax exempt again. So there is no additional cost to the school district to own the property. There's really no tax implications associated with that either. Okay. Basically what I wanted to say. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? Okay. Uh, then we will move back to board questions. Kathy, did you have anything else? Or? Um, I think that it was just about the... Um, the class size guidelines and um, I just and I, I just just to um, com kind of a kind of tracking what um, Marie had said about the the balancing um, like if we were we have five unassigned positions and if we were to use all five of them for the elementary school we would we wouldn't have any flexibility for um, increased enrollment or other um, issues at the at the middle school and the high school so um, I think that's something to think about because we often in the past have used portions of the unassigned position to maybe add some sections if there is higher than expected enrollment in um, courses in those schools so um, it's it's it I mean I know that it's a it's not a great year for resources so it's always a balancing That's true. and you know it's 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 just one of those years you know we can't do everything that we want so just just kind of in a just a comment about that Judy well my concern too and I think it's just because of the uh, letters that we've been getting the emails and things that is Will five on a sign be enough? And it sounds like a lot until you realize how many classes there are around the district. Uh, it, it's hard. I mean, you can't make everything balanced because where you may have 17 kids at one in one class in another school, there might be 25. And it's just that's just the way it goes. But it seems to me that uh, it may be something that we have to look at as adding another one or, or figuring out. Um, I'm sure there will be other questions, but because those were the ones mm -hmm. that we got all the mail on, that, that's really what I was mm -hmm. thinking about. And just as a refresher, how many did we have for this year? How many? Unassigned. We had four this year. We had four unassigned, and we used them all by, they, it was early, wasn't it? No, we actually just used the last of the unassigned okay. about a month ago. Uh, we did address one of the class size issues prior to budget adoption last year so that's why we went down by one I think it was the fifth grade at Westmere we fixed prior to budget adoption because those numbers had already exceeded the upper guideline so I mean ag again it's what revenue do we have to work with mm -hmm. so yeah. we could add another additional unassigned but That's then fine. we have to find eighty thousand right. dollars someplace else to make it up until we know kind of where we land with state aid and some of these other variables. Okay, Teresa. Uh, again, I'll just reiterate what everyone else has already said. And it was such a a very noticeable issue with all the emails that we received, and it was all about class size, which is again why we're here. We're here for educating kids. That's first and foremost. Um, so I guess. 
I'll have to wait and see. It's all just a waiting game, and I can appreciate that. I think people, when you actually really consider it, I agree. There's people that leave, and there's people that come in, so mm -hmm. you just never really know until the very end. And what happened with that kindergarten situation at Altamont, I just obviously don't ever want to see again. I, I guess the only way to do that, and I remember Barb saying, don't you wish we had that extra FTE? <laughs> it's just a matter of budgeting, and you just never know when you're going to need what you're going to need. Well, and recall last year was our most comfortable budget in my mm -hmm. time here, so we actually had the resources. Yes. Uh, this year is different yep. in that respect. Mm -hmm. Next year will be worse. <laughs> Could be. Seema? Uh, my big thing also was about the FTEs available and the class sizes at the elementary levels, but um, I guess going forward, and I'm sure this will come up, I think we should also think about the needs of each school. So I, th I just think about class size in terms of having impact on the students. It impacts all of the students, impacts all of the teachers. So ENL students, gifted, the full range, the class size is the one that reaches all. And so when I think of Gildan Elementary and the ENL needs there compared to maybe some of the other classes that are also in that, not upper limit, what is it, upper? Guideline. Guideline. Yes. <laughs> um, we should just be, I guess, uh, thinking along those lines, you know, what can we get the most for for her, our money? Mm -hmm. And I just, um, knowing that all the ENL um, needs at GES is something that we should consider when we think about um, using the FTEs for those sections. And then I guess my other question was about that smart bonds or the Smart Schools Act. So that's not just for technology, it's for safety also. I'm going to let Damien jump in on this. This is his so favorite topic. Smart Schools Bond Act, there are four categories for which we can apply the funds or use the funds. Um, one of them is high-tech security features, which we have used, actually, and that was one George Amador mentioned that we had received approval and have ac accessed some of those funds already. So going back to when we had the, the stakeholder group committee that worked on developing the, the Smart Schools Investment Plan that has been submitted to the state and approved by the board back in spring of 2016, I guess it was, that was one of the categories that we applied some money. So we've already done the installations of what was in that original proposal. Mm -hmm. um, we're actually seeking reimbursement right now as we speak for that. Mm -hmm. So that was already a part of our, our Smart Schools Plan. So is that mental health part of it, does that fall under that, or is that no. oh, that's no, completely separate? No, it's strictly tech, uh, hardware. Okay. That, so I know when we applied for that, that, that was approved. I remember it was like waiting, waiting, waiting. Well, there's still other projects that were waiting, waiting, oh, waiting okay. for. So, so it's not uh, all done yet. There okay. are several projects that are, are in the queue for approval. Okay. Uh, that was the first one that was approved, which was a combination of some infrastructure work, some technology infrastructure work, and then the high-tech security features which did a lot of upgrading of, of cameras across the district and some software upgrades that linked the cameras to our system. Um, I'll hold off my other questions until later, because we're going to, we have another one on April 10th. Is that after? That's our workshop. Yeah. Oh, the workshop. Okay. Thank you. Can I um, just ask, I don't mean to interrupt and come back to me, but just something that you had said, Damien, about the smart schools. Um, we had... It was sometime last year, around this time, we had to approve um, rewiring, re redoing something with the infrastructure. I think it was at the middle school because what we had done prior was outdated. And now that we're in the process of doing the whole smart school thing, we had to uh, revamp because the technology was dated. Are, are you are you referring to the one to one proposal? Yes. Okay. Yes. That that's actually the main project that we're still awaiting approval. Right. For. So that's my concern is that do you see us I know you don't have that crystal ball, I wish we all did, but do you see us not getting that in the near future where we're no, gonna have to come um, back and redo? No, this in again? fact you'll hear more next week. We have a program okay. report on it we call it the engaged learning initiative, so okay. we'll, we'll be giving a program report on that. At this point I am cautiously optimistic that we will get approval of that project sometime in April. You did say that last year, I, though. I <laughs> said it many times, so hence the word cautiously optimistic. Um, you know, I mean, you, you heard George Amador mm -hmm. speak about the pressure they've tried to put on the governor to release the funds. It has been a long, painful process um, 
for me, especially, I will say. Um, things have been very delayed, but we, we are right now, that project is sitting, the final stage of approval is called a review board. The review board is basically a group of three people. It's uh, the commissioner of education, the, uh, the chancellor of the university system, and then some other person. From the <laughs> division of budget. Thank you. Um, they give the final stamp of approval, but it's gone through the entire vetting of the proposal. All of the dollars have been okay. for it. So we're, we're pretty optimistic it will, it will come through at this point. Okay. Thank you. Barbara? I, I, turn? Okay. Um, I guess the first thing I want to address is that AP English class. Uh, having 28 kids in a section for English AP writing is very, very intense and heavy for that teacher. So if we get the extra monies that we anticipate, I would certainly you know, hope we could at least cover that one. Um, the guidelines that we talked about, the Gildland and the Altamont, the things that I just really want us to be cautious about, when you have a classroom of 24 students or even 25 Across the hall, there's another classroom of 25 students, and it's just total chaos. And it's not necessarily just teacher dependent, but I just want us to be really, really careful that when we create these sections, that we remember how many push-ins are going to be in this section, and how many students with IEPs are going to be in this section, because that makes such a huge, tremendous difference. It really does. I mean, if you had, you know, 24 kids that are self-sufficient and da-da-da, no problem for that teacher. But you just threw one or two kids in with behavioral problems or other issues, that's just a, a living hell for that teacher for that year. So I would just students. really ask people, you know, when you just don't look at the numbers, look at the composition of the class because I think that's really, really important. And um, I, I just wanted to say that. So the other thing that I would really advocate for is that sign language class. There are so many professions out in the world today where if you have the ability to sign, it is such a gift. And I would really, we've been sort of hoping that we can get this started for years now and I know some of the middle, uh, some of the elementary schools have had clubs, and the kids just love it. So if we can throw that in, um, I would love to see that. The other question I have is Dutchman committed. Their funds have been cut. Is there an explanation for that other than just saving money, or did, didn't we use the money that, that we gave them? Is the program not successful? Is it successful? If uh, Regan can adjust address that, I'd love it. Good evening. Um, if you remember last year when we started it, um, that was part of uh, how we were going to start it, is that we were going to start funding ourselves a little bit of money. So that was the reason why we cut some money off it, um, was that we're going to have fundraisers for it to help offset the cost. That was the original idea that we were going to ask for money up front, ask for a little bit less as we went on because of fundraising. Now, how many students do we send to the camp in July, or aren't we doing that anymore? Uh, we are. We're currently, in fact, I just got an email from, uh, from John Underwood uh, last week, um, and he's phasing out a little bit, and so we weren't sure exactly what that program was going to look like. Um, there's another uh, program this summer that we're looking at as well, so we're looking at maybe sending kids to, to both of those. So how many do we send per year, and when they come back, what has been your experience <coughs> this year with those kids? Are they the really student leaders? What's happening? Yeah, yeah, they're really student leaders, and um, it, it depends on interest. I mean, obviously, it, uh, the timing is uh, crucial for, for the families and the kids. If they have other things going on, um, I don't really have an answer for you right now of how many kids are going to go, um, but as soon as I know that, I will certainly share that with you. Thank you. You're welcome. And I guess my last question, we talked about these buses at the high school arriving half hour to a little bit more early, and we said we would like to do something about it, but we didn't put any extra buses in the, in the uh, proposal. 
So are we addressing it or are we just ignoring it or what's happening? Well, we, we weren't, we aren't ignoring it. I mean, we have a system and I think we demonstrated some of the issues that we have regarding access to the high school and what it would require in order to do that. And right. Uh, it's, it's more buses and more drivers, and we really ha would have to look at how we would tier the routes. So it's not a, an easy fix by any means. It's a very costly fix. So this moment in time, without any willingness on the part of the board to spend that kind of money, um, we are moving forward on that at this time. So we're not going to try anything other than... Well, I think we letting the kids sit we, there for a half an hour on the bus. Well, are you referring to the earlier? Because there are. It's not all the buses. Apparently, it's right. only like I don't know, just two a few or, routes. Two or four yeah, buses that are sitting. That are sit. Their right. kids are having to sit on the bus waiting to get into the school because they're not allowed in at we, ten of. What I was talking about was the seven twenty-five drop time. The, right. the presentation that we did, Danielle. Uh, Danielle it, said she was going to address that. Yes, and she's working with those drivers on those on those runs, and it's a handful of runs. It's not so the hope. entire fleet. Pardon? There's hope. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> there's hope. <Barbara. laughs> That's it. Good. Okay, thanks, Barb. Thank Tim. Okay, um, <laughs> I'm still trying to recover from the idea that there's going to be a dollar fee on Uber <laughs> 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 and 275 in other places. Yeah, yeah the, the poor college kids. Um, and, and today's fees are yesterday's taxes. Yep. I mean, it's really just another tax. But uh, No, they don't raise taxes today. <laughs> oh, no, 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 never. <laughs> they just it's call a them fee. fees. It's a fee. Not a tax. But uh, <laughs> back locally uh, and on the subject of money, um, I guess just a couple things I wanted to ask about. Um, there was uh, on this one document that we get with the known savings and all of that different information. Um, for the mental health partnership, um, there was no cost given, but did I just hear that it was 25000 uh, The cost on the known, it should have been on the, it's, the, it's, in a different spot. it's $35,000. Okay. Um, there's no FTEs listed because they would not be Gilderland employees. It would be an arrangement contracted through BOCES with Parsons. And we were supposed to meet with Joe Dragone, who's coordinating it, on one of our many snow days. So we had to reschedule that meeting for later this month. Okay. And it's, it says details are not yet available, so we'll get more information on that and the particulars. Yes. Yes, we're discussing whether it'll be in the middle school or the high school because we need to have a space that meets um, a variety of criteria set by the Department of Health. So that's what we need to work through. And that meeting, I think, is the 27th of March. Okay. Um, and then another, this is all just kind of random, but there was a, a line, and I can't find it right now, but there was a line uh, about... Um, I think it's fifty thousand dollars for lead testing of the water um, that was uh, budgeted this year, and that's carrying over to next year and, um, as being the same fifty thousand. Um, is that is that something that's just constantly ongoing now, or is there going to be a time where you don't have to do that anymore? It, we have a five-year testing cycle for lead, so I thought the fifty thousand was coming out of the budget. But we have Mr. Nooney here, who has just been <laughs> waiting <laughs> to come to the podium to remind us about the lead line. It actually was reduced to thirty-five thousand in the budget, and it won't. I don't know if it'll ever totally go away, Tim. To be perfectly honest with you. Um, We've just, as of today, completed round one. I was down to my last battle with the small cafeteria sink in this building. <laughs> um, and we won, actually. <laughs> so uh, now comes round two, where we're actually going to go out to uh, more of our gang bathrooms, sinks and stuff. We concentrated round one in classrooms, elementary classroom bathrooms. We still have work to do in round two, so it, it, it does continue. Um, I would love to be able to stand here and say that uh, someday 
it'll go away. Someday I'm sure it will go away. Um, I don't know if I'll be here or not. I may be retired. Um, but it was reduced on that line item. That money was, was, was shifted. I mean, it didn't show as a savings um, because there were other increases in the budget. So, okay. And I, I'll also just say that, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you and your guys do a great job. Um, you know, I was still in the classroom when the testing was going on, and it was very interesting and to have signs up saying, you know, no drinking from this. Uh, and, uh, I, 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 I have nothing nice to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sit down, then. <laughs> the nice part is you guys handled it uh, very well. Thank you. So, very well. Thank you, Cliff. Um, I, I guess I'll uh, also talk about class size. Um, it's kind of interesting that that when we uh, saw the results of the survey, you know, class size was big with uh, employees, and it didn't register very high with uh, with the public or with students at the high school. Um, and yet now we're spending a lot of time on class size, and, and rightly so. Um, I would agree with Mrs. Frederigo um, and, and the gentleman who spoke earlier. Uh, if you have a, the minute you say you have a program that's writing intensive, and you're going from 21 students to 28 students, that's uh, that's contradictory. Um, so that that's something I hope we can really look at to uh, keep that number down rather than increasing it for, for that type of a program. Um, and then the class size at the elementary schools, I know we're, we're probably all having flashbacks to uh, September and October um, when, when this was also a big issue. Um, I guess I would say at that time we, we had talked about looking at these uh, range or these guidelines um, and even maybe going back to the GTA and looking at the numbers and negotiating and maybe uh, having a memorandum of agreement. Um, I would still say that's something that, that could be looked at. Um, and, and one other thing to consider is that these guidelines might be getting a little outdated because of the... Uh, you know, they were around long before there was this move to inclusion. And, and one of the things said about the move to inclusion, which started, what, four or five years ago? Two years ago? Okay. Well, it seems so much longer. <laughs> um, but uh, one of the things that was talked about with that move was that uh, there would be um, a, a focus on the class size issue because when you, when you are moving to that inclusion model, and you're, you're having students in the classroom with, with greater needs, and uh, that affects the whole complexity of the classroom. So um, those numbers or those guidelines are probably something that really should be looked at because if you're, if you're starting, and I'll, I'll take uh, the uh, Gildenland Elementary as an example since we've gotten so much uh, email on that. Um, if you're moving towards 24 uh, students in, in that third grade, I think it was going to be, um, and if you're moving towards the, the upper edge of the guidelines for those kindergartens, and some of those students in that mix, and, and that's before even you get move-ins or move-outs, but typically Gildan Elementary is, is a school that gets hit quite a bit with move-ins during the summer. That's going to uh, up, up the ante. Um, but when you have inclusion also taking place, you have some, you know, typically higher need students. And so it doesn't wash with, with higher class size. Uh, so, so one of the things that was talked about back in that, that time period of the move to inclusion was really looking carefully at the class size. So I think we really have to, uh, you know, put a big magnifying glass on that. And, um, not trying to start trouble here or anything, um, but I, I will repeat what I said back in the fall, that there are five teachers that are on assignment, um, and I know that they're in positions that are valuable in the elementary schools, um, but sometimes, like, like we heard Mrs. Frederigo say with the uh, kindergarten change, you know, sometimes change is hard, uh, but if we're, if we're in a time period where we're really um, having to be fiscally aware and tighten the belt, um, 
I mean, I'm thinking how Mr. Simpson saved $500 just by asking a question at a uh, audit committee meeting. Um, we could, we could uh, address some of these needs of class size at the elementary level by looking at those teachers on assignment who, who were elementary school classroom teachers. I know it causes uh, problems with having to restructure services and things like that in the elementary school, but there, there could be uh, ways to do that, ways to address that, and it would be a way to address the class size issue in the elementary school at a either low cost or no cost. Um, but it does, it does impact on some other areas, and I understand that, but yeah, I think if, if we're going to put all suggestions on the table, which I think we should, I think that's our, our fiscal responsibility, um, I just think that should be looked at. Um, nobody has to come in next meeting and have a big uh, lecture about anything. Um, it's just a suggestion, given the times we're in. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you, Tim. You're welcome. Alan? Okay. Uh, I agree with almost everything that everybody else said. Uh, having said that, I, t I take a different approach to looking at the budget. I look at more of the numbers in total. So when you look at the last page of the budget book, you'll see that the 2016 actual number has 91,145,271. Excuse me. 93,719,207. That was just approximately eight months ago, and we're going to go from 93.7 million to 94.5 million in a budget, which is a $4.7 million increase. But yet, I don't see how we're going to spend that kind of money between, between now and then, because if you look at our spending reports, it doesn't indicate that we're spending at a level that we're ever going to reach 98.4 million. So if 98.4 million appears to be a little bit on the high side, I'd like to know how we're going to go from 93.7 to 98.5 million, and then again up to 100.7 million. Those, those are pretty healthy increases over a two-year period. And again, I've said this right from day one while I've been here. I, I think we need to have more emphasis on what our actual spent, expenses were in the last fiscal period and checking them against what we're going to budget so that, and, and also what we're going to have against this year's fiscal period because those two things go hand in hand. Uh, and I don't see, when you look at the ST form, and if you look at the 2017 ST form that was given out when we had the budget, we'd only expensed, uh, let's see now, that's the wrong one. We'd only expensed about half of that. We'd expensed uh, 32 million, no, excuse me, 46 million of it. And we had already been three quarters of the year through. So, again, I know, realize there's some seasonality in the numbers, and, and we, we need to look at that. And a couple of the ones, as I looked at it, that jumped off the page to me was if we were to go look at the uh, cost center 2110, which happens to be uh, teaching school regular. So if we go look at that particular one. What page are you on, Alan? I'm going to tell you in just a minute here, okay? I believe it's 23, but i just double check with you. Yeah, if you go to page 23 of the budget, you'll see that last year's actual spending was 28 million 243,247. Going to go to 29 million 918,505. And if you look at that increase on a year to year basis from an actual perspective, that's a 5.6% increase or 6.6% increase this year and then we're going to budget another increase over next year and I don't know if our negotiated increases had those kind of increases in there and if you look and you read the literature with the headcount numbers we're showing basically flat headcount so with flat headcount I'm having a hard time understanding how our numbers could go up so I would ask that we go back look at our 2016 actuals develop especially at some of these cost centers. And if you, it, it's really easy to do if you take the budget and you take the, the totals on the cost center. There's only like seven or eight of them that we need to look at. I think you need to look at 1620, which is operation of plant. I think you need to look at 1621, which is maintenance of plant. I think we need to look at 1680, central data processing. 2110, which is teaching. 
2250, which is programs, 2610, which is school, library, and audiovisual. Uh, and then we need to look at both the state retirement and teacher's retirement because there's, there's some things there that I, that I don't understand. For example, if we go down to teacher's retirement, we're showing that number going down. Uh, I, I don't understand why that number would go down. I would think that number would go up unless last year when we put together, put some items in the uh, actual financial statements where we accrued for a reserve to offset future costs, then if we're going to use that reserve, then we, I don't know how we reflect that. I don't know if we reflect that as a reduction in the expense for a current period or if we pick that up as a revenue expenditure. So again, I, I, I think we need to look at those particular items. Uh, and I think we also need to look at like our hospital and dental is going up at, at, at 10 point something, 11 point something percent uh, over the next two two years, both uh, from last year's actual to this year's budget, and next year's budget's going up by 11 percent. Those are pretty healthy increases for health care costs. Uh, maybe we need to do something when we negotiate our contracts with our unions because, uh, again, most companies are are passing a lot of those cost increases onto their employees. and. You know, I don't think it's fair for us to pass all those cost increases on to the taxpayer, which is what we're doing when we don't ask the when we don't try to negotiate with our unions and ask them to have more of a higher percentage of what our uh, their, their contributor costs. I work for the state. You know, I, I have over a twenty percent, twenty five percent increase. I'd love to have your guys uh, copay of fifteen to twenty percent, twenty percent here. That's money in the bank for me, and most state workers would love that. And in the private sector, I know some people that, that have like 50% where they have to pay half that. And they don't even have half the benefits that, you, that we do as, as, as employees of the state. I think we need to be more cognizant of, of our fellow taxpayers. Because, again, that one lady had, you know, had, in my mind, had some real good points. We took on land that we have no educational purpose for when we took that library. And I was one that voted for it, but I, I had a hard time voting for it. I had a real hard time voting for that. We have a cobblestone stoolhouse that we don't use. And, we're, and, and we that last year was engulfed the whole discussion of the budget. This year we, we took it out, but it would it would be the major topic for thirty five thousand dollars that we'd be talking about. Three four years ago, we had a piece of property up in east up up by Lake Sockendaga that we held on for I don't know how many years. We're we're not in the business of owning property for for speculation or whatever. We you know we need to focus on what our mission is. We're in the business of, of educating our kids. So that they have a future. I mean, I think uh, Senator Amador said it best tonight. I mean, th they are the future. We need to invest in them because they are what uh, is going to be tomorrow's future. And, and to be having all these ancillary things that we have as a school district uh, that have no, in my mind, have no purpose because they have no educational value because they aren't really adding any value to the classroom. I question why we're doing that. And I and I applaud the lady that came up and asked us why we were doing that. That doesn't, like the thing with the kindergarten last week, that doesn't make logical sense to me. We're in the business of owning, we're in the business of educating people, but yet we're holding vacant land. doesn't make sense. And I, I question why we do that. Uh, but again, I, I strongly urge that we, we, we need to sit down as a group and look at the numbers, understand why the 2016, 15, excuse me, 2016, 17 actuals are one number, how we're going to go from 16 actuals, what the, what our forecast is, is going to be, our real forecast, not just taking the budget that we have this year and slapping it in there and saying that's what we're going to have. Last year we did that and we had, a, according to the document here, we had $3 million of surplus, but we also, I believe we had more surplus because we put some things away in some reserve funds. I don't have that data in front of me, but I, I'll go back and figure it out over the next couple of weeks to figure out how much we put in there. I believe it was somewhere close to two to three million dollars. So that means we had a six million dollar surplus last year, of which we were able to put some of it in reserves. And I am fully uh, supportive of doing those things because some of the reserves that we put in there for like pension and retirement, those costs are going to go up because it's we're in a people business. And, and again, those costs because of the contracts that we have, uh, those are very good benefits. I. I too benefit from those benefits, and I understand that the cost of those benefits are really worth something, and, and then they cost the public a lot of money. And I understand why we should put money away to soften the blow of those highs and peaks because of the way the school districts and government entities are assessed for them, because it's based on a five year rolling average of how the stock market does. So when the stock market does good, you get the sense that everything is really, really good and you, it's, it's free. 
And then when the stock market takes a wicked dive and goes through, through a bear market, you, you pay the pain. And, and I, I really advocate that we should have a smoothing of that by having some type of reserve. I, that's, that's not an issue for me. So again, there, there's a lot of things in this budget that, that I, I really think we should sit back, look at, and, and come up with a, a, what I call a bridge from 2016-17 to 2017-18 to 2019-18. And I will think, I think that a lot of the things that everybody here wants to put back in the budget, that money is already there. It's already in the numbers on the page right now. And we don't need to find, we don't need to wait for the, the, the legislature, even though it's nice to know what we're going to get for revenue. And when we think about the revenue part of it, that's 25 million of 70 million that we have. So it's one third of our revenue. It's a significant component of it. But still, we, we, we can gauge around that because worst case scenario is we're probably going to get no increase. So we assume no increase and we do tax levy limit. We know what our, what our state starting point is for revenue. So we should be able to budget somewhat around that in, in, in a shell especially when you look at the numbers over 2016 and 17. Okay? That's all I have to, uh, my input on today's budget. Okay? So I, I think Alan makes some good points. There seems to be a little bit of a disconnect in the projected and the rollover in the actual budget. Alan, based on, on your analysis, are, would you project that we would have another surplus this year? Yes. If, if I went through and I took the exercise of, of going down through looking at the ST forms that we had here, coming up, I took actually put two years worth of each month into a spreadsheet, come up with a monthly uh, rate, and also looked at what, what things were seen here seasonality. Like for example, during the, the summer months, our, our salaries are basically non-existent, and then you know they ramp up when, when we're in session. So that kind of makes sense. You, you get to see when the retirement payments are made, and you also get to see when the bond payments are made. So you get some, some uh, context to like when payments are made, what, what, what the activity is going to be. And if you look at what goes on. I, I, I'm estimating that this year's uh, actual expenditures will be somewhere between about between about $95.6 million. That, that's my best guess right now. And we've got in there 98.4. So let's call it 95.4 less 98.4. I'm guessing I have about a $3 million surplus. And we, we're a million dollars short. So, we got, so now we've got a $2 million to put in some of the things you guys want to try to do. Again, I think it really bodes well for us to look at the actual numbers to see where we are instead of doing a budget to budget comparison. Because no, last year's budget was an estimate. We're, we're developing this year's spending plan on last year's estimate and rolling it forward. There isn't a business I know that would do that. That's not accurate, Alan. Well, you go accurate. budget, when you do the, the calculation, you're always talking budget to budget. So that, to me, that tells me we're taking last year's budget, comparing it to this year's budget, and we're coming up with a budget to budget increase. That's what we have to do for the community, but that's not how we construct the budget. Okay, that that's fine. That you don't, but again, it, it makes me question, like I, like I did before, why we have an actual expenditures of ninety uh, some million last year, and we're going up like four point seven million this year. That's a big increase. When if you look at the other years, nine fourteen to fifteen and fifteen to sixteen, the increase is roughly about a million dollars a year, million to two million dollars a year, and it's somewhere around the one to two three percent increase. 4.7 million is a 5.1 percent increase. Well, and I think we've talked about this board level before. Each year I have gone back and shared with you where the estimates differed from our actual costs. So you've had that information, our surplus at the end of the year. There has been an explanation, a detailed explanation of why that occurred, how, how the budget was developed, and, and then in actuality where the numbers came up. So you've all had access to that each year. And it is an estimating process. I think mean, you have to realize that we don't have firm information. There's a lot of fluidity with what we have to estimate. Here we are, we're sitting in March talking about expenses that are going to occur from July to the following June. We've got a you know, six, well, three month to 18 month window that we have to work within. We also have to realize that when we're doing school budgeting, once the voters set the expenditure amount, we can't exceed that. So we have to be somewhat conservative in terms of our estimates. If several things happen to go south of our expectations, we can't just go back and, and say, we're going to take money out of reserves, we're going to cover the shortfall from cash that we have on hand. We have to live within the budget that we've constructed. We can't spend more money. So then we're in a situation of having to do mid-year budget reductions. 
and having lived through that some time ago uh, because of a state aid reduction that wasn't anticipated by the state budget, if you want to get parents angry, uh, you want to get staff upset, you tell them come January or February that you have no more money to spend and you have to figure out how to do the rest of the year with the resources that you already have. It's not good for kids. It's not good for parents. It's not good for the instructional program. So we don't want to put ourselves in a position where we don't have sufficient resources to meet our needs. So there is, I'll, I will admit it, and you can talk to any business official, any superintendent in the state, we're not right on the margin of every expense so that we don't leave ourselves any room if fuel prices change, if health insurance costs change. Something happens throughout the course of the school year. We have extra students move in. We need to have classes. All of those things are certainly possible in light of school districts, operations, maintenance facilities needs. All sorts of things can happen during the course of the year that we can't anticipate in March or April for the following school year. So we do have to be somewhat conservative, and I would not say overly conservative, but we do have to build in a measure if, if there's a margin of error, and let's just talk uh, fuel, uh, gasoline prices. I don't know if you've noticed they've been climbing up. They weren't where they were just a few months ago. It's a short period of time that we've had gas prices rise up pr pretty significantly. Well, if we don't account for that in our budget, the possibility that prices may not be where they are today over the next 15 months or so, then we could end up not having sufficient resources to pay for our fuel bills. Well, what does that translate to? Well, it has to come from somewhere. So what a, you know, then we start looking for other areas of the budget because we can't overspend the budget. So we would end up in that situation potentially harming children in the process. So we do take a very diligent look at the budget. We build it, and we're going to do this with the Business Practices Committee. We're taking select areas of the budget. We're going to walk through the methodology. How do we construct the budget? What do we look at? What are the factors? How do we base our estimates? And it's really in reaction to this conversation about okay, we do have a surplus at the end of the year. Is that a terrible thing? I would say no. I think any prudent financial analyst would say no. Certainly Moody's says no. Certainly our auditors say no. That you want to have some money in reserve available to you to help you in difficult situations. And we're actually looking at using reserves in a more grand fashion this year than we ever had before. We have the luxury and the flexibility in order to be able to do that because we have had savings in prior years. Also saves on borrowing costs. We, you know, we've had those conversations before. There are some benefits to having money available to you that accumulates from some, from some surplus from time, to, from time to time, and we see the benefits of that as well. So careful budgeting. We'll walk through it. I, I can assure you, you are going to see loads of data that go into each of the numbers that we've developed here. Uh, we do it person by person. We do it line by line. We do it item by item. So you will see everything that goes into making a realistic budget. But again, we're not going to we're not going to take the lowest fuel price in the last 12 months and project that forward and say our projection is going to hold. We're going to make some good faith estimates based on data that we have from U.S. Energy Administration, for example, about where they project prices to go, and we're going to base it on that. At the end of the day, it's good going to be what it's going to be. You can take workers' compensation costs, you can take retirement costs, we have turnover in our staff. There's a lot of factors here that will change that we can't anticipate. Who's going to retire? Who's going to resign? Who's going to come in and fill that position? Are they at a lower step or a higher step? Um, all of those factors come into play. Same thing with revenue. You know, interest earnings. We did a, made a switch that you all approved, got us some higher interest rates. Well, we made $150,000. That's a good thing. We got more money than we expected because we made a change in terms of our investment policy. Is it going to add to our surplus? It absolutely is. But it's a good thing for us to be doing that. There's lots of good reasons why we budget the way we budget. And it's to make sure we have sufficient resources to meet the needs that we have. And we work with all our administrators to make sure we can meet all of the needs of the students, that we have those resources available to do that. But we can't cut everything to the line Exactly, and if we're going to err a little bit, we're going to err a little bit on the cautious side than on the aggressive side. If that doesn't pan out, we have no place to go. If we have a little bit of surplus, we have something to work with in the future that's going to help us out some of these difficult financial times. So, again, I, I would 
like to see how that works with the committee. We have the, the meeting set up with the Business Practices Committee. We're going to walk through a lot of that stuff. I think you'll get a better perspective on how the budget's developed. Okay. I, I would just Alan? like to comment. Alan? I'm not advocating taking it to the bone. All I'm advocating is that we need to, we should, if, if we're not, we should, I would like to understand why it, there's a $4.7 million increase. And if some of it is built-in cushion, that's fine. But I can remember the last three or four years, we sit here and talk about $20,000 in the budget, okay? But, and and we, like it's gold, okay? But we, we over, we've got a cushion in here of a couple million dollars, and you, you're talking about fuel costs. If you look at fuel costs, it's $200,000 on a $98 million budget. That's spit in the wind in my, in my book. The biggest cost we have is people, okay? And if, again, if you look at the people costs, the people costs and the, and the salaries for the, the teachers, it's, it's up 5 or 6 or 7%. And I don't know if we negotiated those kind of rates. If we negotiated those types of increases, then it's legitimately okay. But when you read the, 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 the comments in there about the FTEs and stuff, it's, it's basically flat FTE. So, again, the question really that I have because I'm not into the detail of the weeds, is, you know, what are our assumptions? Are we, is it the contract that's driving it? If it is, great. Okay, then there's nothing to do about it. We all signed on the dotted line that that's what the cost is going to be. But I think it's very prudent for us, and I do advocate that we have some level of cushion. I've never said to strip it right out. But I also think there is a fine line between having an, a good amount of cushion and having an excessive cushion, okay? And I don't know where that is. That's where we lead you guys. But again, to, in order to know whether it's ex excessive or not, we need to have a better understanding of what that $4.5, $4.7 million is made up of. If, you know, if, that, that, if the $98 million has a cushion of $2 million in it, then okay, my, my forecast of being at ninety five is isn't too far off. Okay, and, and I agree with you. We have to have a cushion. I'd never advocate no cushion. Never. Thank you, Alan. We have uh, Gloria on the phone. She's here. Okay, does she want to weigh in? Gloria, anything you would like to add? Oh, hold on. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, I do want to uh, say that a couple of things that I had an interest in have already been re uh, remarked upon, so I won't uh, spend any more time on them. Uh, that was the high school elective question, which Kathy and Barbara addressed, and the, uh, uh, the, the need for watching the class sizes issue especially at the elementary level, that's been spoken of, so I won't. You know, I'll just say I support both those positions that have been voiced. Um, I do have some two or two other issues or questions. Um, it's referred to that uh, there's some money set aside to expand the co-teaching at the elementary level, and I was wondering what that's uh, going to look like, and what the expansion would look like. Is it by school, grade level? How is that uh, being approached? I think we have lost our special education administrators. And our elementary. Well, our elementary principals. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, all right. Well, we can hold on that Come one. back to that. We'll come back to that one. Uh, is, okay, is Mike Laster around still? He's yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> hiding, but he's here. Hey, Mike, come on up there. <laughs> I was just wondering if you could... Hi, Gloria. Thank you. Um, so currently we have 16 homeroom sections at the 8th grade level due to enrollment. Um, so this enrollment di driven decision basically uh, allows us to preserve teaming. Um, our current situation this school year is we have half time teachers who are only here every other day for students. So for next year by moving in a 14-14-14 configuration across all three grade levels, class sizes will remain pretty much the same. Enrollment is going down a little bit, but we'll be able to have full-time teachers who will be teaching a split team, 7th and 8th grade, but they'll be here every single day so that all students can access them every single day. Okay. This year, that's, that's not... My yeah, so this year, I mean, ideally, we would have loved to be able to go 16, 16, 16 sections, but given the situation at the state level, we're unable to do that at this point, and we'd rather, we'd rather have full-time teachers in the building so students can access them every single day. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yep. Thank you. Okay. 
That's it, Christine. Thank you, Gloria. Um, I'll be brief. I, I think it's just I would uh, share the concern about the class size, but I do understand this is a difficult budget year, so I guess that would probably rise to the top for me. Um, I just did have a question. Have we tried to solicit any donations like the one that we got last year from any local businesses or no that was kind of helpful okay <laughs> um, and then again I would just commend you for including the mental health clinic in there I think it's really important but that's all I have at this time does anybody have anything else that they'd like to share um, yep. last year when Dr. Fierro was here there was something that he had mentioned regarding the labs at the middle school. Was that addressed at all in the budget? About allowing for, he said it was actually a, a safety concern with some of the science labs at the middle school level. Oh, sorry, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, that was actually uh, the reason why we were able to get two more homeroom sections last year was because the current eighth grade enrollment necessitated that move. Um, so next year's enrollment among all grade levels are lower than it was this year so even though I think there's probably you know maybe I mean those labs are designed I think for about 25 learners maybe there's a class or two with 26 or 27 but it wasn't like it the year that was. Alan was uh, in seventh grade level that cohort which is now the eighth grade this year was was bigger it, that, okay. it was a bubble basically okay thank so, you yep anyone <laughs> else okay well, I guess with that, there's no further business to come before the meeting. We would need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Alan, <laughs> second Judy. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Damien. You're welcome. Oh, yeah. Have a good night. You want to sign it? <laughs> of course. Oh, I know. I'm so excited. Right, we'll be the first person. So, I am. Um, so. Here you go. Oh, yeah. Okay. We are. I bring the sheet.